Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, it's my great pleasure. I'm Elizabeth Hudson. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts, Media, and Design. And at CAMD, as many of you know, we have been working to really transform the disciplines across the college by engaging creativity, communications, media, and human-centered design with the potential uh, in relationship for data and new media technologies to enhance human experience. I can think of no better exemplar of these strategic priorities than our distinguished lecturer this evening, who is Dr. Elizabeth Hill. CAMD launched the Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series in 2018. It is an interdisciplinary conversation series inviting leaders in arts, media, design, and across academia and industry to weigh in on the biggest ideas and most pressing issues in the fields. Past speakers have included sculptor, artist, and sound suit creator Nick Cave, designer, entrepreneur, and MacArthur genius um, Alex Truesdell, Wall Street Journal Technology Innovator of the Year Noni de la Pena, and author and media scholar Ethan Zuckerman. And I'd also like to offer thanks to Curry College of Computer Science for co-sponsoring today's lecture. And I want to be sure and invite you all to join us at a reception immediately following the lecture. Dr. Elizabeth Churchill is a senior director of uh, is senior director of user experience at Google. She holds a PhD in cognitive science from the University of Cambridge and a master of science in knowledge-based systems from the University of Sussex. She is an applied social scientist, an interactive technology designer, and a social communications researcher. She has worked in academia and in industry in various roles as an individual contributor in management and in a consultancy capacity. She has built research teams at Google, eBay, Yahoo, Park, and Fuji Xerox, and has held various leadership positions at the Association of Computing Machinery, ACM, including Secretary Treasurer, Vice President, and Co-Editor-in-Chief of Interactions Magazine. She is a member of the ACM's Chi Academy and an ACM Distinguished Scientist and Distinguished Speaker. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Churchill. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, and thank you all for being here. This is the Elizabeth Show. <laughs> um, I really appreciate you being here, and it's wonderful to see some friends in the audience um, and see people who will be friends, I hope, um, after this and you know, into the future. So I do want to give you a warning. This is a very idiosyncratic little wander through human-computer interaction from my perspective. You don't have to agree with me. In fact, if you don't and you want to add something, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Um, but I wanted to just sort of talk a little bit about how I came into human-computer interaction and what I think it is and where I think we're going, especially in these really exciting times. And um, Elizabeth and I were chatting about interdisciplinarity being essential. And it seems to me that this environment is perfect for fostering that. So whatever your passion is, you can find a place for it to be applied in collaboration with others to hopefully make the world a better place, which is what we all want, right? So with that, I just wanted to let you know that this talk was written by Generative AI. <laughs> no, just kidding. But there are some bits in here where I have used various tools, and I will point those out to you, and various, um, shall we say, curious engagements. <laughs> so there are lots of definitions of human-computer interaction as a scholarly discipline, field of investigation, and field of impact on technology uh, platforms, services, and products. A very lean definition is human-computer interaction is concerned with making things useful, and usable. I think a better definition is human-computer interaction is a discipline concerned with the design, implementation, and evaluation of interactive computing systems for human use, and with the study of major phenomena surrounding those particular things that we build or put out into the world. So while some of the things I'll talk about will be, you know, surfaces, like your phone surface, that being in context is really the big picture story. And this is an old definition, but I still love it. 
because it really brings together this idea that there's people, there's technology, and there's context. And I love to talk about context, for example, when we think about what is an available and accessible technology. Because, you know, something that is completely available and accessible to me, you know, if I am walking as I am on my flat shoes, may not be as easily accessible in my, you know, seven-inch La Poutin. I don't actually have any of those, but I think you get the point. Um, you know, me carrying two shopping bags, I remember going to, um, it was a Le Corbusier building years ago, and I was walking down this corridor, and I was like, wow, if I had two large shopping bags, this would not be wide enough for me. The context of your, whatever you're doing, your activity, sh is shaped by and formed by what you're using, what you're inhabiting, and what you're around. And so it's very important that we understand context always. Another form of context, which might not be physical, might not be cognitive, might not be visual, for example. How many people have been out in the sunshine and you squint at your phone and you go, I can't see that at all? Right? Well, another context is what is the use? What is the thing that you're using, trying to have you achieve? So many of the things that we have in our lives that are techn technical, interactive, are discretionary. You choose to use them, and there are no serious consequences for non-use. However, if anybody takes the New York Times puzzles away from me, there will be trouble. <laughs> the personal productivity tools and applications are needed to get personal things done. They're useful, but not essential. And you may use alternatives. I often drive to the supermarket, but sometimes I get the bus. Uh, my personal productivity is somewhat enhanced by me driving, but not if I can't park, because <laughs> then I'm irritated. So that's another context. And I would like you to think about, for example, your calendar apps, you know, your email apps, and so forth, and think about productivity and whether you need to use them or not. Everyone in this room has a bunch of applications they use in order to get their job or their work done or their learning done. And you may or may not choose those. They may get approved for you. But the reality is you have to ha use them in order to be productive. And, you know, if it's work productivity and it's tied to people's evaluations of your success of productivity and goal achievement and recognition, so it's not so discretionary. You know, because you have to be in that system. Your latitude for adoption or non-adoption, your latitude for change there is limited. And one of the things I'm going to talk about all the time is, you know, what can we change? What can't we change? And what does it take to change something? Is it about moving a few pixels or is it about changing a policy? These two things move at different time scales. Anybody who's been on any standards bodies or policies bodies know that you have to get used to being in that conference room with that bad carpet, possibly four years. Um, now there's essential and safety critical. These are high stakes uses. They're serious consequences for non-use. When we think about the healthcare world, many things, serious consequences for non-use. When we think about, you know, a large scale system, like a, um, you know, a manufacturing system, if you don't do things in a certain order, in a certain way, serious consequences. One of the things that, you know, one of the measures that we have in my industry is frequency of use. And people say, well, what's the daily active users? How many people are using it? And I'll be like, yeah, well, you know, that one big red button, we want nobody to ever use it because that is the system shutdown button. <laughs> when you need it, you really need it. And you have to hope that you will never need it, but you better design it really well. So with that, I want to sort of remind us all that sometimes when we think of something as being successful as an interactive technology, it might be because it's not used, but it is available. And that is the context of design that you have to have that. How many people have read of things in the newspapers where they just didn't think of the frailty of the system if that one thing wasn't there. What, they, what, what were they going to do if it went down? We had a lovely conversation this morning, some of us, about fragility of infrastructure, and I'm going to come to that in the end. So the past, 
This is my idiosyncratic version of human-computer interaction. Firstly, it's been around for a while. This is Google's Ngram Viewer. It basically shows the, the frequency of use of certain words. And what you can see here is, you know, user experience really has taken off, and I think this is sort of aligned very much with digital technologies coming into the consumer space. Human-computer interaction has been trucking along. Human factors increasing in the 90s, and then sort of goes up a little bit again now as we start to see, I think, distributed and embedded systems. So digital technologies and interactive technologies in physical spaces. Now, another thing I'm going to just say as a general thing is like what we label things really matters. If anybody has been playing around with prompt engineering, you know words really matter. And so some of these disciplines also gain popularity and go out of popularity. And especially in your context as scholars, you know that those hashtags, what you call it, which conference you send things to, do affect these numbers. But the overall general picture is that we're really kind of seeing human-computer interaction being steady. So for me, human-computer interaction as a field really is based in human factors and ergonomics. One of the mantras of human-computer interaction is the right information in the right format in the right place at the right time. So cockpit design, unfortunately, wars do tend to lead to a lot of investment. But uh, cockpit design during World War II was critical, absolutely critical. And here what you see is people who are highly trained, hopefully not like we have to be on our consumer discretionary apps, highly trained to be embodied and embedded in a really complex system. Another thing that we talked about this morning, a few of us, is that we are always embodied and embedded in complex systems. We are in the AI, and the AI is around us, and we are the AI, <laughs> the augmented intelligence. Um, and what's interesting about this is that you see these analog dials, and you know that this person has got haptic physical feedback. They've got visual feedback. They've got dials they're reading. They know how to read that information in the right way at the right time in response to a deeply embodied experience of being in this machine. And I like to think about human-computer interaction as more that than interaction design at just a simple interface. Because like I said, you know, if you're walking around in the sun, that beautiful interface and you can't see it, and you fall down a manhole or bump into a tree while you're trying to, these are embodied interactions. Another one I love to show is, you know, computers were, as somebody said it earlier today, computers were people. Um, and here we are with these amazing people um, managing the machine and the machine being part of them and them seeing what the action and interaction output is. And they are deeply embedded and embodied in this system. And it is to some extent, for those who are trained well and expert, tangible but also transparent, which is something that we're like thinking about right now. I can see what's going on. I always have to bring up Grace Hopper because a huge part of human computer interaction isn't just the digital interaction you have, but it is also the production of that thing through coding and documentation being part of that. So when you're all coding or learning anything, having the documentation really matters, unless it is a discretionary app, which is easy to use, but you need to be trained into other things. And I like to think of Grace Hopper as the first UX person, because you know Grace Hopper was basically, uh, coding is awful. And you know she, she created, well, she probably didn't quite say it like that, but you know. Um, uh, you know, so she created a prototype for the first English-like data processing language. She went to the human to say, what does the human need? And she kicked off thinking about, well, you know, you can actually make coding accessible in the biggest sense of the word of accessible. And, you know, this was a precursor to COBOL, and COBOL is still lurking out there, trust me. <laughs> but, you know... That thinking, that mindset of what is it that people are good at? What do we do to put those things 
in the hands of people such that we're taking their cognition, their perception, their physical embodiment into account. And so if we march on forward, the computer revol revolution, um, you know, suddenly everybody's got these on your desks. Um, so office automation systems, the 1970s, and look at that screen, it's amazing. Um, and you know what, those keys probably made a fantastic clacking sound. Um, but what was interesting about this was it did in many ways democratize computation and it improved productivity. And we did need to train people, but there was less training. And then we started to have an expectation of who should be able to have these. So, you know, here is this image of this person sitting there. Now, the early models in human computer interaction of human cognition with a computer were very much focused on the brain, uh, information processing, the information processing model. Card Moran and Newell's information processing Newell, published in 1983, talks a lot about human information processing time frames and lapses and errors and those sorts of things. Now, what was particularly interesting about that model was that it presupposed that cognition you know, works in general the same for everybody, which we now think maybe isn't the case. But it also presupposed, because of the nature of um, the interaction that's going on here, on here, is that somebody's sitting in front of a screen, in front of a computer. So, of course, they didn't think about the whole body and the emotions and all the rest of it, because their model is really about being tethered to a thing that you're looking at, which we all know is not the case now. I was running around the hotel room earlier today with my laptop in my hand like this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, trying to press on buttons. Um, so, what was interesting, though, is that that model is a very good model, but it wasn't even the right model for the time. Because, look, you were sitting in an office, and there's a couple of people there, so I'm, like, sitting here on my terminal, and I'm like, Oi, Gracie, did you have that, that thing that I need? <laughs> you know? And Gracie says, Oh, you mean the thing that you lost yesterday? So it's social. It's profoundly social. So a lot of models, for example, early models of intelligent tutoring systems made the assumption of a single learner. And this was before we all had email and chat and all the rest of it. A single learner sitting in front of something learning. So the models were of a single learner doing something and acquiring knowledge. But actually, the reality is I would probably turn around to somebody and I would go, Oi, Liz, do you know how to do this? I mean, I would do it in you know, chat now. But those models of the sociality is what we are confronted with now and we have to take into account. So, to go to the flat screen for a moment, I am the only speaker who says you can look at your phone, but not for very long. Um, making, making screens, making interaction possible to go where the people are, really kind of took off with you know, things like the desktop GUI model. And it was around about 1980, I think, when the Altos, I might get this wrong so people can correct me, was the first operating system that really was for a GUI in, in interaction, the graphical user interface. But look at the metaphors and models that are being used here. You know, this is what it should look like. A phone should look like a phone. Now, interestingly, most people in this room, when you see the icon for save, probably don't know where that comes from. The old floppy disk. <laughs> but anyway, the point here is though that scaffolding, scaffolding through reaching out to people through metaphor as well, has always been really important. And this was the Xerox star in 1981. I don't think we've come that far. Not really. But why is that? That's because I think it actually kind of works to scaffold knowledge and action and production. So around about that time, Elizabeth mentioned the Association for Computing Machinery, the ACM's special interest group on computer-human interaction, kicked off in 1983, but there had been a prior meeting, I think in 1982 in Gaithersburg, I think that was right. And what's interesting about this for me is that Firstly, many of the scholars who started this whole com conference series and activity, set of activities, are still in the field. So I'm warning you, once you get in, you will never want to leave. 
because that you'll be fascinated. You'll be watching people all the time and going, oh, interesting. Is that how you do that? Yeah. But they had put out an advert for this, and um, they were expecting about 100 people. And they got, what, 700, was it? Something like that applied to come. It was something crazy. Because, you know, these desktop devices had started going out into the world. People were starting to see the potential for personal computation. Companies were seeing the potential for productivity through computation. And people were like, these things are really hard to use. How do we make them better? How do we make them easier to use? How do we go to where the people are? We're spending a fortune on training as well. And we've got like five specialists and the need for 500 people to do this stuff. And apparently, you know, this got all kicked off much to everybody's surprise and it has been a thriving field ever since. What was going on when all of these amazing people were gathering? Well, um, there, there is a computer as you can see it. And then we've got uh, Microsoft Word. Hasn't changed that much, frankly. Um, We've got a synthesizer, and we've got, we've got the disc. Da, da, da. I think my heart was broken. I, I have like 600 vinyl albums. My heart was a bit broken when everybody started using CDs and stuff instead. But uh, now they're all digitized, of course. <laughs> but here we are now. Well, this is a few years ago. This is one of the first renditions of Google's material design, which is our design system. And... One of the interesting things about material design is that it really, as one of the first design systems, um, one of, not the only one, um, really understood that you have to have con continuity and consistency across different surfaces. So through color, through branding, through action and interaction, um, you can move across. So now we have gone from tethered at a desk to moving across devices to, you know, we can talk about what we now have is multimodality with Internet of Things, etc., and all of those speaking devices in our homes who are really irritating, frankly. But um, the notion that you keep, that you scaffold understanding from one place to the next through consistent branding and consistent engineering and interaction really took off, um, you know, about, I'd say it was only really about 10, 10 12 years ago. And now we know we have amazing design systems. One of the first things anybody does when they set up a company is come up with a design system. Because what we know is that our users, whether they're experts or novices, will be less frustrated, move more quickly between these different surfaces, and you capture their minds and hearts through your branding and through your consistency. These were just some of the renditions that Material Design did when I was working with them. And... This was one of the real things around branding because we did a whole bunch of research to show that if you, if you have these different kinds of brands, um, like uh, vi visual brand and color brand, um, we did a lot of research around emotion. What does this evoke for you? And everything from trust, don't trust, to feel happy, to feel productive. And it was really, really interesting to see how that affective stance carries through people's use of what you offer them, your offerings for them. Um, people feel safe. They come to a particular place and they go, oh, I know those colors. I feel safe. Um, when I was working at one of the companies I work for, not my current one, I remember there was a rollout of a question and, a, a question and answer system um, that was very, very, very popular. And it was, um, uh, it was an update. And it was far superior, like unbelievably better from every angle, from a cognitive point of view and a workflow point of view and a speed point of view. And the community that used that question and answer service, outcry, absolute outcry. So the other human emotion is we don't like change, even when change might be good. So a huge part of human computer interaction is not just scaff scaffolding cognition, but it's scaffold, scaffolding the emotional response of action and interaction, but also change. So that is also part of our remit of thinking about how we take these things out into the world. Of course, now, I mean, this, these are relatively old images, but we've got the speaking devices in the home, multimodality. We've got, you know, a, a, AR, VR, interaction, training systems, games, you name it. And some of them are amazing. 
Um, I'm one of those people that often, if it's not calibrated exactly perfectly, feels thoroughly nauseous. So that is another thing for us to think about. What percentage of the population are we excluding from experiences? Because physiologically, they just can't deal. Um, we've got augmented reality. This one, to me, is totally, I'm falling down a manhole. I am going down a pothole with this in front of me. But anyway, I think there's real potential there. I'm particularly interested in these devices being used in manufacturing situations where you can put information, the right information in the right format, in the right place at the right time with a device. Um, and then how many people have a whole host of smart home objects? Me too. Uh. I was telling somebody um, the other, uh, just today, actually, that um, the entire inside of my house has currently been gutted because there was a plumbing incident and so my entire kitchen is gone. Um, and I unplugged one of my devices that apparently was the hub device, and now nothing will speak to me. And I'm like, <laughs> all, right, all right, this is pathetic for two reasons. One, one, one is my response to it, but the other is just how lazy I am. I'm, I'm like lying in bed, and I'm going like, herself, turn the lights off. Uh, not working. And then I'm grumbling, I've got to get out of bed to turn the lights off. I mean, <laughs> we're back to fragility. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not best pleased by this situation. <laughs> um, interestingly, one of the reasons I went to Google initially was to look at um, a new infrastructure for Internet of Things, which was local mesh first, cloud second, so that you could actually control your own internal data and control and manage these devices differently. So infrastructure is another thing that um, I will keep coming back to. Here are some more. These are, again, these are pretty older images, but the, the interesting thing is that the images might be a little old, but the ideas are still there. And the form factors might not be fully there yet, but the ideas are. So I've been talking a lot about the pace of change, and the pace of change might be slow, but human-computer interaction and user experience skill sets and methods will bring you back to the thing that is the core essential part of the thing what you need to change, what you need to iterate on, but potentially also where the market fit might be and when that fit might be right. Um, so skin-based interfaces, not so much yet. Brain-computer interaction has really advanced massively. And especially in the healthcare world, this is just so much potential here. Um, did anybody have Google Glass? We have a couple. We have a couple of people who are admitting it. I used to, I used to do research on dating sites, and I would always say, Has it, "Who's been on a dating site?" And nobody would put their hand up. And I would say, "Statistically, it is not possible that none of you were on a dating site." <laughs> but anyway, thank you for your confession. <laughs> um, Google Glass is a really good idea. Again, I think in productivity situations, like manufacturing situations, um, I live in San Francisco. And walking around with a bunch of, I'm sorry it was blokes, um, with these things on their heads and they're looking at you as if they're going to kind of like talk to you. And this is their interaction with you. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, the social protocol has been broken. <laughs> this is not working. I hope it's working for you because it's not working for me. But anyway... So there we go. Um, uh, I even put pre-World War II in here because even starting in World War I, the world of human factors and actually organizational design was already thinking about people in, in context of technology. So uh, uh, does, do people know about the Hawthorne effect? Yeah? So, you know, the Hawthorne effect was, you know, if you put the lights up in a factory, everybody's more productive. Oh, great. Then if you wait for a little bit longer, methodology question productivity goes back down. So, you know, you might not like change of your technology, but change might actually change your stance to something. <laughs> um, so we've got World War II and after, we've got office automation, and now we've got the 80s, and this multidisciplinary glory that is human-computer interaction. And now we have AI. Da, da, da. And, you know, I've got co-adaptation and a dream of teaming and intelligent agents and collaborators. And those are sort of dreams. So if we're in the present or fast forwarding to sort of now, you know, a little while back, this happened. And everybody went crazy. Um, and here is, here is artificial intelligence in that same n-gram viewer. And I don't want you to just notice how high it is now 
I want you to notice that it's been around a long time, really. And everyone's still like, what does it mean? And what is it? What is artificial intelligence? Mm. Artificial intelligence, obviously, is a field of philosophical engagement. It is, a, it is a field of design and development of tools that may or may not be augmenting of human abilities and cognition. And as Doug Engelbart said a long time ago, augmentation, for me, should be the goal. Um, AI is a broad field of a whole lot of sub-techniques sub that exist in the small and in the large. And then there, of course, is this giant thing that's going on in the world right now. But I think it's a really, really fascinating moment. It's a fascinating moment for technology, but it's a fascinating moment for humanity, as in, us as individuals, as well as a collective. It's a fascinating moment for climate and sustainability. It's a fascinating moment for cross-border collaboration or not. It's everybody should be critically engaged and critical in the best sense of the word. So according to a McKinsey report, there were 10,000 plus AI products launched. Then notice that AI was not defined in this um, in 2023. AI powered products and services and AI as a service. Now, how much what AI and how much AI is under the hood um, varies wildly <laughs> and everyone is claiming it. So like I said with the first engram viewer and I said, you know, words matter, words matter here. It, it's like, do you remember Intel inside? It's now AI inside. We just haven't got a single logo. But, you know, AI in various formats has been around for a while. If you think about the filtering of information with smarts, with these kind of search, auto, you know, search suggestions um, and kind of, you know, interactions and so forth. And, and, you know, these have been incredibly useful. Back to the productivity angle on these things. You know, it's reduced friction, reduced time. Um, and people like using them. And it's actually increased creativity in lots of ways because, you know, you put in some terms and you get a whole bunch out and you go, oh, I didn't know that that was a synonym for this. So real scaffolding and augmentation in a great way. Um, we've also known that these micro assists can go quite wrong. Um, and I'm going to come to power and power dynamics in a second around that. But I was on the internal um, dog food, we call it, but trial of, you know, when you put in a name and it sort of... It, it, automatically completes the name for you. And um, this was not, in fact, I was not writing to my friend Clara, I was writing to a senior vice president at Google, who luckily I know well, and I'll tell you why for a second, because the data set that they had used to train this model, for some reason, decided that it was really important that I call this <laughs> seriously. And, well, luckily, I mean, luckily I didn't send it, but, but I did tell him. Um, and I told him, well, you know, of course you're beautiful. <laughs> but, but why I bring that up is that these tools are really, really good. But when they go wrong, do you have the power in the system to repair? So if I was a junior intern and I wrote to an SVP with, hey, beautiful, that person would be mortified and probably get under their duvet and not come out for weeks. But the reality is it didn't even flummox me because I was, oh, I know women, and I know what the data set is and I know why it's doing it. And what I have to do is file a bunch of bugs and let him know, which is what happened. But I think these things are important. Um, how many people remember, um, was it damn you autocorrect? Oh, yes. I love that. Um, a friend of mine was splitting up with his um, partner and they had a joint, a shared dog. It was all mutual and there wasn't much animosity. Animosity, a little maybe. Anyway, so um, the partner was going away, and my friend types to uh, and, and gets a message. My friend gets a message saying, "You know, can you take care of the dog?" My friend responds, "Don't worry, I will execute the dog." <laughs> it was meant to be exercise, <laughs> and then it was like, "Oh God, no! Did that hit send? How many people have sent something? No, 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 no! Not that! Not that!" And also the worst one where you're writing to one person. Oh, I actually did this on Facebook the other day. I wrote on somebody's thing on Facebook, but I'd had a break in between and I came back. Um, and I, I, they were writing about music, <laughs> some band they liked. And I wrote something like, was it a poisonous snake? <laughs> because I thought I was responding to someone else. 
And this friend wrote to me and said, I've listened to every single album and it was a great, great journey back into that, but what were you referring to? <laughs> it's like, oh no, oh no, I just went between screens. Anyway, mistakes have been made. But we have moved on, and this is just a screenshot of um, an internal tool. Um, and, you know, how can I help you today? And I actually have found these uh, tools to be extremely useful um, for a whole load of things. I'm going to talk about coding in a second because that's what my team, one of my team's research is. But we've been thinking about the attention economy for a very long time. By the way, that image was generated by something or other, uh, stable diffusion. I thought it was quite good, actually. I quite liked it. Um, but information economy, this saturation of so much information... And I actually find a lot of these tools very, very useful for doing summarization. Now, summarization is a really important task, but as you know, anybody will tell you, scholars in the room, you know this, somebody who's not an expert summarizing from a subpart of a you know, corpus of information may get it wrong. So many of you are educators, um, you mentor people, and you know that that brilliant intern knows some part of the field, and you ask them to do a summary, and they come back and they've missed stuff or they've misinterpreted, and that is fine, because it's part of the education. With these tools, how do you give feedback? In fact, this one does have feedback. You can go in and correct things. But also, you know, most of the ones that are out in the market, it's hard to give feedback. It's hard to know what the corpus was that was used, you know, to generate that summary. And when I talk about, you know, cross-border collaboration, this becomes a huge problem. I remember one of the research projects that I loved years ago was um, somebody had done this brilliant analysis of Wikipedia in different languages. And, you know... The description of Elvis varied from country to country, and that was a pretty benign one. You can imagine how others might have varied. So I, mean, I just think this is an interesting area for us to be thinking about. What is the data set? What is the cultural norm or set of values that has been embedded within the corpus that is part of the system that is giving you the answers? How do we get transparency into that? How do we give feedback and how do we do effective comparison so that we can actually say, hey, we need to do something. This is HCI. This is information analysis to understand how we're supporting decision making and cognition. Um, a friend of mine said, oh, yeah, it's just autocomplete with uh, paraphrasing. And I was like, well, it's a bit more than that, but it's more that it's a bit more influential than that. Because trust is another thing. People are like, oh, well, it's a very, 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 very expensive, very smart machine. It must be right. Or people are just busy and they're tired. And they're like, all right, okay. There was that lawyer, wasn't there, recently, who cited a whole bunch of completely imaginary <laughs> cases. And I, mean, you can, I can forgive them, right? You know, you've got like 50 things to do today. You press a button and it looks fine. All right, I'm gone. Back to the what is safety critical and what is not. Um, I wanted to show you this one because I wanted to have this point about choose your words, choose your understanding, choose how you critique or uh, in investigate or how you go in, how do you do prompt engineering. And this ended up being a lovely photo by this person who I don't know on Unsplash. Um, but I really liked it because, uh, you know, this person took it and I went and I did a search and I got this and it was just fantastic. But when I asked the internal machine to create an image for me, couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Because my query was too weird and ambiguous, I think. I mean, if I said to you, can you help me find a picture about choosing words? You'd be like, well, what do you mean? You know, you would, we would have a dialogue. What do you want it for, Elizabeth? What's the audience context? Uh, what kind of image? You know, do you want to frighten them? Do you want to make them happy? What do you want? Um, but, you know... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where are we? Human AI collaboration. AI, and I'm using AI as artificial intelligence here in the large. Um, processing massive amounts of data, detecting patterns, rapid summarization, repetitive and highly structured tasks. These are all really, really good things for an HCI context. Where we excel 
understanding nuance and context. Well, why do you want that picture, Elizabeth? Common sense reasoning. Common sense being a highly loaded word, of course. But again, it invokes and provokes a query dialogue. Creativity and originality. We're going to come to some creativity stuff in a minute. Um, emotional intelligence and empathy. Um, I, I still love the experiments when that journalist was talking to one of the chatbots and it went completely off the rails and fell in love with him and asked him to divorce his wife. I mean, it was just off the rails because it was building on, you know, working on models and it got triggered by this and it like spun itself out into a particular scenario. But can you imagine if you weren't somebody who was critically engaged with understanding that is some kind of bot? What, what the heck is going on? Um, dealing with ambiguity in new situations. Humans are really, really good at that. Really good at that. Um, and so far, um, the systems we're building aren't there. So, but what's exciting? Well, I think we've got back to HCI and design and interaction design. We've got some adaptive interfaces that uh, adjust to a user's abilities, environment, and emotional state. I mean, you know, your uh, phone screen changing in, you know, daylight isn't exactly super intelligent, but it's, it's pretty useful. Now, what other adaptations could we have? Intelligent assistants, virtual assistants that become true partners capable of proactive suggestions and anticipating our needs. I mean, maybe that's possible. And, you know, we get to work with people to figure out where those things are good and where they may be harmful. Enhanced accessibility, AI power tools empowering everyone with different abilities to interact with technology in new ways. Everyone. And this notion of universal access, I think, is really important here. Really important. I have to say, I mean, it's a slightly sort of, it's related but not directly. I love all of the language translation stuff. I love it. Um, and, you know, you'll go and you'll try three or four times to make sure you've kind of got it right. Um, <laughs> and also, again, culture really matters. I'm laughing because one of my friends used to translate, I think it was from Spanish. And she said to me, she said, you're pulling the radishes up by the roots. I have no idea what that means, but it did stall me in my tracks, which I think was her intent. Another thing was a friend's, a friend's mom, who's a German speaker, was telling me that something sells like hot bricks. And I was like, okay. So translation, really, idioms are hard. Idioms are really, really, really hard, right? But I do like translation. So, Collaborative workspaces, environments where humans and AI seamlessly work together. We were talking this morning, a few of us, about it would be really great to have a walk in a room and I talk to the big screen and I say, can you show me pictures of yarn bombing, please? And the pictures come up and I'm like, you know, what, what were we talking about last week? You know, these sorts of things I think would be really um, lovely to have. Um, so this is the school. Creativity, impact, communication, design, technology. You care about creative tools. Um, Co-creators in art, design, music, and other forms of new expression. And, you know, is the question, is AI going to replace creative professionals? This is an article in Interactions magazine by Bautic Joshi, when, and he was at Adobe for a long time. And he just says no. He says, looking at the history of technology and filmmaking and photography, we see the potential for amazing augmentation, new forms of interacting, new forms of creativity. I've been telling people about um, Xerox art. You know, the Xerox machine came out and, um, you know, suddenly people were making arts with collages and bits of paper and people said, that is not art. Um, but it is. I mean, mine was terrible, but most people's were pretty good. But, you know, these technologies can be really, like, playful um, and I think, they w I think they'll enhance and expand and augment. And we need to figure out what those things are. And I think a whole bunch of you in this audience are already doing that. And that's why this is so exciting, being at this school. Because you're going to get the chance to do that in a way because of your interdisciplinarity that you, you wouldn't get anywhere else. So this is really exciting. Um, of course, there are plenty of nonsense things. Did everyone see the Amazon thing that happened last year where the like people are automatic books are being published and generated automatically. And the fascinating thing about this, though, was that people could tell the difference. Readers were like, this is kind of rubbish. 
this is not holding my attention at all. So, you know, there's something discerning about us hum humans that those little AIs cannot get past us. But I thought it was very interesting that this is, this is a market force doing this, right? And not necessarily one for good. So again, that transparency. How do we look in under the, the hood? Anyway, I'm just going to go through a couple of examples. And then how am I doing for time? Where do you want me to stop? <laughs> I, I could talk for days. Um, um, so my team, looks, my team uh, works on a next generation operating system. And what we do is we work with developers to understand their productivity and to support them with better tooling, uh, which includes you know, things like tools for um, end -to -end testing, tools for debugging, tools for commenting, um, et cetera. And the promise really is there to support a lot of coding activities. I mean, here are just some of the things that came out in the last year. And there's more now, more and more and more. Um, and these are all pretty exciting to me. But you know, we went off and did a bunch of studies with loads of developers across the company in different areas, not just ours. And people were like, you know, chatbots can help with documentation summaries, generate code and, and test, fix problems for me. These are what the people said they wanted. Save me some time, answer these questions and suggest improvements. Do it for me, translate between different languages. Generate documentation. You know, back to Grace being the first person who cared about documentation and actually, you know, accessible coding. Um, draft code, assisted code reviews and debugging. Any of you who are coders in here know the code review is just... um, automated testing, resource efficiency measures, performance refactoring, and program management is something that people want help with. I think that one's tougher. Here's what was happening. Poor quality code and hallucinated APIs and parameters. The response is unhelpful and does not take context, context into account. Lack of depth in response. You really didn't ask me the questions <laughs> as to what I really wanted. Edited queries return the same results. Oy. Clearly, in, so, so that's a human saying, look, I'm going to give you more information. My prompt engineering is changing. You're giving me the same stuff back. Goodness. Clearly incorrect responses being recycled with apparent certainty. I know I'm right. And this concept debugging is not there, repetition, um, no technical depth, and, and this hallucination problem. So uh, we're not there yet, but I'm, I'm loving these old frameworks that come from old human factors, automation stuff, um, you know, where we start to look at what are the tasks and where should you know um, an AI augmented system sit? Where along the way, like if nine is you know supervisory control because it's a really simple task and I'm just doing supervision, um, one would be manual control, two would be action support, blended decision making. What what I ask you all is you know people interested in human computer interaction, hopefully, and you know technology design and tool design. Where, how would you design these different kinds of interaction to incrementally potentially surface more and more information to give control to the system or to the person? In, like, you know, the big red button I talked about at the beginning, that big red button, the human decides, and it's always available for a very good reason. So I think these frameworks are really wonderful ones to think about what is the design that we want to scaffold what is the action and interaction we want to scaffold and what is the design i asked um, one of these systems when would i ask a human rather than you overall you might ask a human rather than me if you need a specific piece of information that i don't have if you need an answer to a question that requires a creative or ri original thought if you need an answer to the question that is sensitive or confidential or if you answer, need an answer to a question that is not in my knowledge base. I thought this was particularly self-aware. I quite like this one. <laughs> yes. The future. I'll go through this pretty quickly. But we've already talked a bit about human AI collaboration. And I see that um, con axis of control from manual to fully automated as being about the complementarity of, based in the task context that leads to the transparency and control in the right moment, in the right way. 
natural intuitive interaction, advanced natural language processing, multimodal interaction, huge, 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 huge. Um, responsible data use. We have to really engage with responsible data use and avoiding filter bubbles. And like I said, it's from pixel to policy to purpose, right? So we're going into some of the stuff around where we need policy. We need to establish trust and have explainable AI. And that term explainable AI needs to be continually revisited as to what we mean by that. Because it's meaning different things to different people. Minimizing bias and algorithmic accountability. So important. Um, these are really interesting areas where you know, they might sound sort of very abstract and generic and way highfalutin. But, you know, I've been talking to people a little bit about, you know, the design of one single button with just a few pixels might give you the example you need to actually go and say, I need to be involved in minimizing bias. From the smallest interaction, you could end up having to have the biggest conversation. So one of the things I would say to folks is that if you care about these fields of action, please take your time to think about the policies that lead to what gets built. There have been so many strides made in the world of accessibility by setting standards. There's been so many strides made in that world by people like me being able to go into a large corporation and say accessibility should be first as a consideration, not as a table stakes patch. Because here are the standards that a lot of other people spend a lot of time in rooms with bad carpets to come up with. But please, engage. Engage. Um, I want to give you a few examples of infrastructure. So the brittleness of what we build. This is, uh, this is when um, all of the robo-taxis, not all, but many of them in San Francisco, came grinding to a halt and closed down the whole of the north part of the city. Because there was a giant festival on, music festival. And everybody, their dog and their donkey, were all on their phones, uploading videos and images. And the bandwidth of everything just, no, no such thing. And all of these cars just went, alrighty then, no access. I'm just going to stop right on here. I'll see you all later. And it just shut down the city. A more serious example is the Maui fires. The Maui fires took place in a, you know, in a location where the in and out wasn't great, but also the, uh, basically the connectivity failed. Massive failure of connectivity. And this is this thing about this failure mode that I said about we have to speculate about early in design. What happens if it goes away? What happens if that red button doesn't work? What happens in a failure situation. And in safety critical systems and ergonomics, that's what people learn all the time, to think through that speculatively. And we have to do that. I mean, I don't mean to be completely doom laden, but I do think it's important. Because when it fails, it really fails. I mean, we just saw that terrible thing that happened in Baltimore. Terrible, terrible. Um, you can't avoid all of these things, but we can at least think critically about them in our space. Um, and unfortunately, the cars have been taken off because although this car reportedly didn't actually kill somebody, it, the person was hit and then the car didn't know how to stop. These cars are full of sensors and they work in very, very complex socio-technical systems. And there's a reason why a lot of these are being tested in cities where the roads are pretty straight. I would not want to get in a robo-taxi in Cairo. Not happening. Not happening. So the context, again, back to context. Misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. Back to it might not be AI hallucinating. They might intentionally be being produced. And the deep, this is a great book. It's about deep fakes. You know, so one of the questions I always ask is just because we can, should we? So it's a great book. And The Innovation Delusion is another one that I really love. Um, I was chatting with folks about this because, you know, a lot of the tech industry has been built on, like, innovate, innovate, innovate. Run fast and fail or run fast and fall over or whatever. Um, actually, 
The real heroes who should be getting the billions, the people who keep the lights on, who do tech debt, infrastructure, legacy fixing, who go in and say, we are not going to have this happen for our people. This is not a you know, useful situation. Um, those are the people who should be valorized. And you know, we have a lot of legacy debt. We have a lot of infrastructure that does not integrate, and it should. Um, one of the things we've done in my group um, is that we, we don't give awards for people who come up with a new, next, shiny thing. We give awards for people who find areas where we can fix tech debt and then go and fix them. We give awards to people who look at documentation and improve documentation because that makes it more uh, equal for all. So anyway, my summary. Is it useful? Is it sustainable? Is it ethical? I think underlying all of the things I've been saying is a little bit like this. So is it useful? Does it really serve a purpose? Not usable, but useful. Usable falls from that once you know it's useful. Is it sustainable? How many people have got like a box full of old phones or old stuff and you're like, oh, I need to recycle this? I mean, it's just ridiculous. Ridiculous that we buy things and then they're obsolete in a few years. Um, I, I still have my... I, I'm still holding out for the Nokia N95 coming back. <laughs> I still have mine. I was telling people earlier that that phone was so hilarious because it wasn't really a phone. I could, I could play a Moby video at the drop of a hat, but I couldn't actually find where I phoned people because it was buried in menus. Um, and, you know, just because we can, should we? So this is my summary of the big picture. Human-computer interaction is about technology and devices. It is about interaction and service design. It's about the physical environment within which those things sit, whether they're embedded technically or whether you're just wandering around using them. It's about people group, groups and cultural practices, the cultural practice. There are places in the world where sitting on a train with your phone blathering on is just not acceptable. I like those places. A social ethical and policy, accessibility, sustainability, these are issues as well. And so HCI is from pixels to policies to purpose. Or it might be pixels to purpose to policies, but you know what I'm saying. It's from the small to the large. It's from the immediate action at the point of touch to the big action at the point of standard and policy. Or should that thing exist? And the great news is that you don't have to be good at all of those because the HCI community is really, really integrated and collaborative. And if you want to know something, you can always find somebody who's going to help you. And so if somebody says, you know, well, the accessibility standard for this is such and such, and you've got this color scheme on that, and that's not accessible, you go, oh, okay, thanks. That was helpful. Thank you. These were created by, what was it, PixArt for me? And I want to just put that uh, out there because I put in the prompt, the future of the world is ethical design of human-computer interaction, and I got these. And I think they're quite nice, but I am sufficiently not an artist or designer to be able to tell which one is better than the other. So any of you who are skilled in these arts out there, we still need you. Otherwise, we're going to have me producing things like this. <laughs> Thank you. Time for questions, or did I blather on too long? No? Okay, great. These are my steps. All right, from the third Elizabeth in the room. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you, and great fun. Um, as you know, but others may not, I work in the area of technology for older adults. Um, and I am just so stymied and frustrated by change for change's sake in the digital platforms and services. And can you comment on whether it's the trend towards accessibility or social responsibility? How can we intercept the field such that my entire group of users isn't just thrown completely off because a trivial change messed up everything and then they're just likely to, to give up and walk away? 
you. That's a great question. I think that one might be able to get more traction in that safety critical and or healthcare or something like that. In the consumer world, getting that is going to be really hard. But if what one does is start with establishing that this thing looks like a consumer experience, but it's actually health critical or safety critical in the way it is being used, then I think one can come at it from that direction. So starting to tell the stories of what from your data. Yes. Yes. These consumer platforms, but if what one can do is come at it from the angle of here's the bus here's the business benefit for you, but you know here's why um, this actually falls within a policy that you cannot change. So one of the things about accessibility uh, standards for me is that they're not policy. So you need people, advocates on the inside doing that. And I think what we want to do is tell the stories of criticality, raise the potential for a business model, um, but then start to like look, look into how can we make some of these standards and policies. So if you have um, an, art, you know, a, an experience that is being used for these reasons that have not, not been surfaced in the, the use cases, uh, use cases, use cases, Use cases are so often like, this is what I do. <laughs> Worse than that. Worse than that is, I'm a senior VP and my children do it this way. <laughs> Hate that. Hate that. Um, we, have, we have to get that conversation into the hands of product managers, leaders, and people who are frightened that if they don't do something that is sustainable, that that will be a negative impact on the business. Um, it's, a, it's a big task, but we have, to, we have to come at it from all angles. But, you know, first, surfacing those cases is critical. Um, and then getting, you know, using any platform, social media, at FUBAR, why does this not work for this population? Did you know that that's like another 100 million users for you? Um, yeah, finance is such a great example. What a complete donkey's mess. It's awful, isn't it? Awful. Oh, there's one here. Hi. You can oh. I go first? Sorry, sorry. Just, just because I just want to follow with that. Part of it is the is the profit model, and how much the profit model is driving the notion of innovation, so that it's so. How do you combat that aspect? <laughs> All right. I think, I think. I mean, seriously though, I think that the the, the thing is to come up with an alternative profit model. It has to be. Um, I. We have to come at it from all sides, from all sides. New users. Yeah. Y yes. You know, that's such a great point. That was. Um, you're not getting. If you're not getting new users, then you're not seen to be being to, to being be, be being successful or expanding. Um, and if when I was working at eBay. The number of talks I gave on cus lifetime customer value. But then eBay was a different beast, of course. But um, going back and looking at how many of the people on the eBay platform are consistent and persistent and have been there. And if you look at the profit over this period of time, not this period of time, w what are we learning there? Um, but it's such a great question. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, Hi. Yeah. Um, so thank you for being here, and thank you for Northeastern to you know sponsor this, these kinds of events. I've been in the technology industry and the communications marketing side for three decades, working with you know the big companies. And you, there's there are a lot of things that you mentioned today that ring a bell, but I want to focus on one. Looking around, it's so exciting. I mean, it's like we have the United Nations of the world here, <laughs> and people that can solve real problems. I'm bilingual. So I'm going to focus on the on the language problem. Oh yeah. Uh, because so much uh, in in this technology innovation world is about you know, Google be, beating Microsoft on Bing and Copilot, and you know Microsoft falling behind, and then Google, you know, there's always that feature war which drives me crazy. But the one thing that I didn't see was um, that I think a, a lot of us coming from different countries see there are things in our environment and problems, critical problems that we can solve for. Mm -hmm. before we even start thinking about user interfaces. So if mm -hmm. we do a communications campaign, let's say, mm -hmm. and we want it to be multilingual, mm -hmm. 
it's a disaster right now. And it's a basic of, you know, linguistics 101. So to me, and I wanted to just hear your opinion, and I'm someone who's worked a lot with researchers from IBM, mm -hmm. which are always pushing the limit on, you know, yeah. AI bias, yeah, yeah. explainability, and all that. And that's not enough. How do we get AI, and the portion that a lot of the generation mm -hmm. here is looking at right now is just chat GPT. I mean, you know, let's not get into machine learning and data science because that's a little bit more complicated. What can the communicators and the creators in this room, people that I can see probably speak seven more languages than I do, can do to first pick the problem to solve for mm -hmm. so that we start using AI and the data that is stored in all these mm -hmm. proprietary systems to solve real world problems as opposed to the latest use case mm -hmm. that goes into the air fryer. Oh, let me take this, put it in the air fryer, I'll mm -hmm. come up with a new recipe. We don't need 100 recipes. We need re mm -hmm. recipes that fix the, the current world problems. One of them has to do with translation, which is terrible. So yep. I'll let you comment on that. Well, the first thing is you're in marketing. We need you. <laughs> we need, I'm serious. We need you to help us figure out how to talk about this stuff. Um, very serious. We need your skills and the kinds of skills that f folks like you so that we can start to tell the stories on the different platforms and the different l languages, meaning audiences. Um, and we do need to do that. Um, in terms of translation, um, there is a, there's a huge amount of work on translation being done. Um, identifying what are the top three problems we're going to be solving for. So we don't end up with use cases that are useless. Yeah. Um, well, uh, well, translation is one of those. So actually work that is being done right now is to um, scrape different corpora, I think that's the right word, um, from around the world and do translation and then do the summarization that I was talking about. So um, Albrecht Schmidt and others um, uh, in the HCI community have been doing this. So what they're doing is rather than doing you know, a diary study with 12 people, which is a very, very good methodology, very important methodology, what they're doing is scraping information from multiple sources um, about people's interactions with technologies or reflections on certain kinds of policy issues or whatever. And so they're looking to see what trends there are in terms of how people, what people are surfacing as issues and problems at various different scales. It could be from interaction to a policy scale um, from around the world. And like that Wikipedia example I gave you, doing some comparisons on that. So I do think we can use some of these technologies to essentially do very large-scale user research by looking at different platforms where people put reviews or have discussions or have conversations. And the different platforms is the critical thing here because each platform has at least one but possibly many very precise kinds of cultures of their own. So what you want to see, like what somebody might put on an Amazon review, which might be a trivial thing, is not necessarily what they're going to put on Twitter or put on Facebook or whatever. So there is some work on that, and I do think some of these tools can help us to surface some of those issues, which are the critical issues to work on. Now, back to the business conversation, though. Who is going to work on them comes back down to the business criticality. And that's the thing. I think the one place that there is some, again, healthcare to me is a place where a lot of this stuff comes together um, because it has to. It has to. I mean, I think the problems that you're surfacing, we need to make, make those become the issues because we have aging populations who need to be supported in different ways. Um, but yeah, it's it, yeah. That's all I've got for you. Um, thank you for the great talk. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, um, you talked about HCI and its application in like various different fields. So, so what I see HCI as is helping users as you know automating certain processes or you know easing their use of a particular piece of technology, be it hardware or software. Um, when it comes to automation, like you know, like ChatGPT or any sort of like those um, HCI applications, uh, it might be different for different fields. Like what I need to automate might be irrelevant for a designer. What they need to do, like with their creative inputs, it should be manual. So when you launch products is from a commercial standpoint, like how do you make sure that you provide options for the various different fields? Because you know 
know like your user is going to be from a student to like a senior researcher kind of thing. Uh, that was my first question. And my second question is I'm from coming from a health sciences background and you talked about like different applications of HCI or generative AI in, uh, in health sciences. Um, so what about the process you automate? There always needs to be like a human intervention in, in uh, healthcare to make sure things are going right because I was just looking at your email example of, you know, prompt as, hey, beautiful, and stuff like that. So when you're automating certain processes uh, in healthcare, what is it that you do to make sure you have a sanity check that, you know, it doesn't go wrong? Or if something goes wrong, there's a backup. Well, I mean, I don't actually work in healthcare, so I'm not sure. Um, I, I can tell you methodologically, but I couldn't give you particular examples. Um, but, you know, methodologically, what you would want is to have, you know, a really, really well-scoped trial with lots and lots and lots of different scenarios. And I always really liked doing um, sort of experiments of when you've got automation, ha having, so say you're going to do a task, you know, we could automate, it's almost like it's the Wizard of Oz technique, right? So you have somebody who's a human reacting to you behind the scenes of the screen. And they're starting to see um, what is going to go wrong and what's not. And where do they get into a problem giving you a response? So say you're going to do action A, B, C, and D, because you want to get to goal Z. Um, behind that screen is a human responding to you. And if that human has a protocol of interaction or response, which would be what an automated system would do, and they're like, oh, don't understand that, what does the human have to do? So you Wizard of Oz it. Um, you also, I also um, really like studies where when something is put out there, you have essentially an ethnographer observing your action and interaction. So they are shadowing you with the use of this new thing and their job is to observe when you're making decisions, what your information space is for clarification, where you have to go back and do an undo, or where you're puzzled. And their job is to also, um, in some of these situations I could imagine, to generate the worst case scenario if that thing had gone wrong. So there's a really horrible case called, it was, it, I think it was labeled as when um, what, what killed Jenny and it was um, a, a medical interface. And the thing was that they had changed it, and the button that needed to be clicked was so tiny, and the person was in a hurry. And now if you'd been observing that, and you'd seen this new interface, and you'd, you, it's like, oh, you, you missed that button, and it turns out it's safety critical. You know, a trial of something like that. So, you know, I believe in in-situ testing with deep observation. I believe in Wizard of Oz testing. Um, so that you can start to see where these things might happen. Um, as for the first part of your question, um, adaptability and tailoring, um, I think we're getting, in, in, we're getting better at that, but I think most of the tailoring that is done um, is, is fairly minimal, what you can do. I mean, if you're a little bit more technical, a lot of things, uh, tools and experiences that have open platforms you can extend, but you have to have a bit more technical skill. But, but there's a sort of disincentive for companies to give that to you. One is potentially liability, right? <laughs> What's their scope of responsibility? But the other is the branding and consistency. And then there's the third one, which is the cognitive scaffolding of, right, you change something and now the interaction flow is different. And then when we do another patch or another change, then it doesn't work with you, you know? So, but and that's more in the kind of consumer space. But, um, that would be my kind of gut feeling around that, but great questions. Thank you. You're being attacked from yes, multiple sides. Oh, oh, you're first. You. Um, can you stand up? Um, um, some of the most common types of computer interfaces that are powered by AI we've seen have been uh, chat models, uh, chat interfaces, uh, transcription, voice commands, especially in a lot of new devices such as the Rabbit M1, Human AI Pen. What are some of the new interface formats that you think AI will power in the future that especially improve the discoverability of AI devices. So going back to the example you mentioned earlier, um, how can we use AI to make that button bigger? How, to, how can we use AI to read the intentions of people and then bring them the information that they want? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think there's a whole bunch of interesting things. Um, uh, eye gaze, 
for example. You can imagine if I start to have a deep understanding of the way in which you engage with a, with a, a screen or an interface, and I see where you're looking, and I see, oh, he's always looking over here for something. That could be an adaptable interface that could change based on your eye gaze as a personalization model. Um, we could also have a look at eye gaze from a lot of people, potentially, privacy notwithstanding, um, and, and then say, well, people always look over here. Um, I think a lot of the interesting interfaces to me are the multimodal ones, where, you know, you could learn about, you know, say I've got, you know, um, uh, something, you know, like a, a rehabilitation thing for my leg because I've hurt my leg, or in my case, it would be my back. You know, could you learn my motion and movement, and could you actually figure out that people who got better, who had the same similar motion and movement to me, actually had these, like, does anybody have one of those things that's supposed to make you sit up straight where it kind of goes, bzz, if you do this? And I'm like, oh, I kind of like sitting like this. But no, bzz. I mean, you know, if you're sort of going through something like that physically, if you're an athlete, I can see some really interesting surfaces for learning about body and change and, you know, your own quantified self for your personalized data, which could be, you know, matched to anonymized data from somebody who has similar patterns to you to see if something could, you know, be tested and changed. Um, I think uh, I talked about the conference room earlier. Being in a conference room that learns that, you know, when those four people, from, you know, from the calendar invite come in, they always talk about the following things. And here are some recommendations of things that are adjacent to that that they might want to see on the screens or whatever. Um, so I think this all kinds of fun. Um, but, you know, every single one of those examples I gave you is like, I think they're super fun, but they always abut on that algorithmic responsibility and data and bias. They're always going to bring those up. So um, the funnest part of doing what we do is coming up with wacky ideas. And the funnest part should also be and figuring out what could go wrong. <laughs> you know, so I'm not sure I really answered your question, but if you're ever in a brainstorming session, I want to be there too. Because you ask great questions. Okay. Oh, no. we've got one here. Yes. I got, I got a Mac, so, yeah. so it was nice to meet you on Douglas Postdoc. And um, so I've been trained with NLP background by current, I think I'm a HCI researcher. And I was always fascinated by how rapidly those natural language models been evolving, because you know the bird, like the one, the language model, recent language model was introduced in 2018, and just like mm -hmm. six years later. And at the time, I just read a, read a paper, at that time people were called bird a large language model at that time. Yeah. But now people were calling like GPT-4, those billions, thousands of billions models. These models are large language models. And these models nowadays, they have much more knowledge to some like perspectives yeah. better than uh, ordinary human beings. They are trained on those um, boxed corpus mm -hmm. that no, no, not a single individual human can read in their own lives. Mm -hmm. But how do we like better in the future to actually align those models' capabilities to in those tasks? Maybe the models doing better than humans to some extent. How do we better like to coll collaborate with humans and models and to, to build the next level of the human computing actions? Mm -hmm. I want to hear some like suggestion. What are the perspectives you are thinking about and ideas? Mm -hmm. And also recently, I think OpenAI had a new proposal, like a concept called super alignment, mm -hmm. which is something very inspir inspiring for me to think about what will be the future of how we can build those better human computing actions. Yeah. Well, I think you've asked the question that everybody's asking, so I'm not sure I've got an answer for you. But I do have a serious answer, which is, um, I'm really interested in what's happening with um, very domain-specific small language models to see how well they work in context, which is like the coding examples I was giving, right? Now, if you can imagine having a few of those doing different subparts of an overall task, because every task has subparts, right? And then you kind of support along the way. And then you learn about, well, what would be the overarching thing that would actually help? So rather than trying to automate the whole thing or collaborate on the whole thing, collaborate on the small, small subparts. It comes back to that automation axis that I talk, talked about. How would we get certain subparts with different AI techniques with different data and different output need along each part of that, that continuum um, to start thinking about the big picture? The funny thing, when you, when you, I, I might be tired, but when you were talking about the, the models are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, didn't, what was in my head was when you put a peep in a, a microwave. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And what you end up with is a bit of a mess, really, isn't it? And it doesn't taste very good. But anyway, that was what came to mind when you said that. Thank you for that provocation. We should... We need to move the conversation now uh, yeah, with the reception, but I know there's lots more questions. And just join me in thanking Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.